OK, so we're going to have a look at a really cool method here, which is basically a way of solving quite challenging looking combinatorial problems using fairly simple tools from probability. So before we get into exactly what the method is, how it works, there's just a bit of explaining what the kind of problem is that we're going to apply it to. So just bear with me while we explain what the problem is. So basically we're interested in the integers from 1 to n. If you rearrange these in a circle however you like, then we're going to be interested in sequences of consecutive integers that are all the same distance apart from each other on this circle. So for example here we've got n equals 7 and you might spot that the integers 4, 5 and 6, these are consecutive and they're also all the same distance apart on your circle. They're all two steps apart clockwise or five steps apart anti-clockwise from each other. And then we're also going to allow this kind of wraparound behaviour once you reach n, so 7 here, because if you have a look at 6, 7, 1, we would count these as consecutive integers, and these are interesting because to go from 6 to 7 clockwise, this is four steps, and then to go from 7 to 1, this is also four steps. So this would also count as a sequence of length 3 of consecutive integers modulo 7, which are all the same distance apart, they're equidistant. And it's quite challenging to actually get a bit of a handle on even finding all of these sequences for some rearrangement. So I'll just show you quite a nice way of getting to grips with this sort of setup. Because if you have a look at the distances between each pair of consecutive integers, so the distance between 1 and 2, if we go around clockwise, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 steps to get from 1 to 2. And then to go from 2 to 3, this is 3 steps clockwise. To go from 3 to 4, this is only 1 step clockwise. To go from 4 to 5, it's 2. To go from 5 to 6, this is also 2 steps. So you see this kind of structure that 4, 5, 6, this is somehow one of these interesting chains where it's all the same distance to go from 4 to 5 as just to go from 5 to 6. And this is reflected in having the two consecutive 2s here. And then you get the same sort of structure. The distance from 6 to 7 clockwise is 4 steps, and then the distance from 7 to 1 clockwise, this is also 4 steps. And then from 1 to 2 is 5 steps, so this doesn't extend any further. So you can sort of see here you've got your two sequences of consecutive integers all the same distance apart. These kind of correspond to having consecutive numbers here, which are the same. So now I think we're ready to actually state the problem that we're going to try and solve which is basically we're looking at for n greater than or equal to 5, so we're not interested in two small cases with n, we want to know is it always possible to rearrange these, so to rearrange the integers from 1 to n in a circle such that there is no sequence of length 4 or more of consecutive integers which are equidistant from each other. So this is the problem that we're going to try and solve in a moment. So I've promised a method where we solve this problem using probability. And at the moment, it's not really looking like something that you could apply probability to. So what I'll do now is just explain the sort of probability kind of setup we're going to use. So the very first thing we do is just fix the value of n. And then what we're going to do is imagine choosing uniformly at random from all the possible rearrangements of the digits 1 to n. So we choose uniformly at random from all of the, and there are n factorial of these if you think about it, possible rearrangements into a circle of the integers from 1 to n. Okay, so this is our sort of probabilistic setup, and then what we're going to be interested in as our kind of random variable is going to be, I'll call it x4, so here it depends on n as well because n's fixed, I'm going to omit that notation. And we basically call this, informally, this is going to be the number of sequences of length 4, so sequences of 4 consecutive integers which are equidistant in our rearrangement. So we've got this kind of informally, and what I'll do is now just write this 
So we can write this more formally in terms of kind of indicator functions of events. So I'll explain what this means exactly in a sec. So let's just have a think, what are our potential sequences of four consecutive integers? Well, you've got one, two, three, four, you've got two, three, four, five, and so on. And you can even go all the way up to n, one, two, three, because remember, we're allowed to wrap around once we reach n. So there should be n of these in total. If I call this the sum from i equals one to n, we're going to say the total number of such sequences equidistant is the sum of the indicator functions of all of these potential consecutive integer sequences being equidistant. So we've got i, i plus 1, i plus 2, i plus 3. We say if this is equidistant, then the indicator function is going to be equal to 1, so it adds 1 to our count, and if it's not, then it just adds 0 to our count. So just so that we've written it out more formally, the indicator function of some sort of event A, define this as equal to 1 if A occurs, and we call it 0 otherwise. So here we're saying that if i, i plus 1, i plus 2, i plus 3, if these are all equidistant from each other in our circle, then this indicator function is equal to 1, and it's 0 otherwise. So we've got a nice kind of more useful form for x4. Okay, so what is this actual method we're going to apply to this now that we've got a probabilistic setup? Well, what we're going to do is, basically, I want to show that the expectation of x4 is less than 1, and this will solve the problem for us. So this seems deceptively simple. Let me explain why this is the case. So I'll explain intuitively to begin with, and then slightly more rigorously in a sec. So at an intuitive level, if you imagine if the average number you're getting, your expected number of these sort of problem sequences is less than one, as you sort of pick, you go through all the different possible rearrangements, then that must mean that some of these times, as you keep sort of sampling, you keep rearranging them, sometimes you must have zero such subsequences. And this is actually what we're trying to show, isn't it? That it's potentially, it's possible to have zero sequences of length four of consecutive integers which are equidistant from each other. So if we can show that the expected value is less than 1, then this means that it is possible, at least some of the time, to have zero such sequences. And if you wanted to understand this slightly more rigorously, you could do just a very simple application of Markov's inequality. So probability that x4 is greater than or equal to 1 is less than or equal to the expectation of x4. And then if the expectation of x4 was less than 1, this implies that the probability that x4 is greater than or equal to 1 is less than 1. But then this also implies then, because x4 is taking positive or zero integer values, the probability that x4 equals zero, all your other probabilities, the probability is sum to something less than 1, so this would have to be greater than zero. So basically this is saying that it's possible, there's a probability, which means there's a possible rearrangement, at least one, such that you have zero sequences of four consecutive integers that are all equidistant from each other, which is what we're going to try and show. So now let's show that the expectation of x4 is less than 1. And to make a start on this, we'll use linearity of expectation. So this basically tells you that you can write the expectation of x4, because this is a sum of indicator functions, we can write this as the sum of the expectations of these indicator functions. So let's write it as the sum from i equals 1 to n of the expectation of each of these indicator functions. So here I'm just going to be a bit lazy and write indicator of dot dot dot. I'll write it out in full for the next line. Because if you spot here the expectation of an indicator function, I think the indicator function, this is equal to 1 with probability of that event happening, and it's equal to 0 with probability of the event not happening. So then this means that you can write the expectation of an indicator function simply as it's just equal to the probability of that event happening. So this is the probability that i, i plus 1, i plus 2, i plus 3 is equidistant, or basically they're all the same distance apart on your circle. Okay, so now what we'll do is we'll try and calculate this probability, and we're going to actually end up with an upper bound for this probability, but that's fine because we just want to bound this from above by 1. So let's write this is less than or equal to, we'll keep the sum i equals 1 to n, Hopefully you can see here that the value of i shouldn't really make a difference. It doesn't matter if you're trying to do 1, 2, 3, 4, or 2, 3, 4, 5. So let's calculate the probability, or at least an upper bound for the probability, 
that this sequence is equidistant on our circle. So if you imagine, because we're picking uniformly at random from all the possible permutations, let's imagine we start by placing i, and obviously it shouldn't matter where i goes, and then if you think about where i plus 1 goes, this probably shouldn't make much of a difference, because say if they're two steps apart, then all you need to do then is make sure that i plus 2 is two steps away from i plus 1, and then i plus 3, that has to be two steps away from i plus 2. So all we really seem to care about is the position of i plus 2 and the position of i plus 3. So let's imagine you fixed i and i plus 1, then this means that i plus 2, this has to go in one specific place out of the n minus 2 remaining places that are available, because there's only one place where it'll be the same number of steps apart. And it'll be the same thing for i plus 3, there's one place for it to go now out of n minus 3 possibilities. So why isn't this actually equal to the probability? Well, we've kind of glossed over, it does actually matter where i plus 1 goes in some difficult, annoying cases there. So for example, let's say that n was an even number, and then i and i plus 1 were n over 2 steps apart from each other. Now hopefully you can see then that you try and place i plus 2 n over 2 steps apart from i plus 1 on your circle, then you see that i is actually already occupying that space. So unfortunately that wouldn't work. So there is some kind of dependence on the position of i plus 1. But that's fine, basically we can just bound this from above by this probability. But there are other cases as well you can think up where, for example, you try and place i plus 3 and you'll find that i is already occupying that space, etc. So we've just got an upper bound for the probability here. And then this is quite a nice upper bound because nothing depends on i here, so you can just multiply this by n. So you get n over n minus 2, n minus 3. It's our upper bound on the expectation of x4. So now all we need to do is show that this expression is less than 1 and then we'll be done. So let's write this, we'll do a long chain of if and only ifs, so n over n minus 2, n minus 3, this fraction is less than 1, if and only if. So remember that n is greater than or equal to 5, so this denominator is positive, so we can multiply by this on both sides of the inequality, so if and only if n is less than n minus 2, n minus 3. Then let's expand the brackets here, and we'll also take this n over onto the right hand side, so you end up with n squared minus 6n plus 6 has to be greater than 0. How are we going to show this for all n greater than or equal to 5? Let's complete the square. So this is true if and only if. Let's write it in completed square form. So you get n minus 3 all squared. We've got to subtract a 9, add 6, and so minus 3. So this has to be greater than 0. So we take the 3 over onto the left hand side. This is all true if and only if 3 is less than n minus 3 squared. But I'll also take square roots of both sides here, which is fine because n minus 3 is positive. So we're looking for the positive solution to this. So this is true if and only if root 3 is less than n minus 3. And then this is true if and only if root 3 plus 3 is less than n. Okay, and now we've reached a point where root 3 plus 3, this is something that's less than 5. So if n is greater than or equal to 5, then certainly n has to be greater than this thing that's less than 5. And we've actually completed the proof here, so let's just sort of go over all the steps again. So when n is greater than or equal to 5, this implies that n is greater than this thing that's less than 5. And then this is true if and only if all of these different steps, and then this eventually implies that n over n minus 2, n minus 3, this is less than 1. But then this is an upper bound on the expectation of x4, so this shows that the expectation of x4 is less than 1, which is exactly what we were trying to show. So this shows that on average, as you do all the possible rearrangements of the integers from 1 to n, for n greater than or equal to 5, the average number of these that give you a sequence of length 4, where they're all the same distance apart, this average is less than 1. So that means that at some point, as you go through all the different rearrangements, there must be at least one arrangement there, where you have no sequences of length 4, where they're all the same distance apart, which is exactly what we were trying to show.